morning. Today, Saturday, September 12, 2020. Today is a regular yoga therapy class through Satik Space Yoga and Healing Studio. Today's uh, topic, very interesting topic, today's topic will be yoga therapy and women's health. Now I've seen already people are joining. So I have open question for all of you. What does yoga therapy has to do with the women's health? Second question is, when you go to a yoga conference or go to yoga studio or when you teach a yoga teacher's training classes, guess what? 80 to 85% are the, the women. What is the reason for women to join the yoga class and not too many men? So there's another open question to you. Why so many women are in the field of yoga? I teach a yoga teacher's training courses. I get a very good, nice compliment many a time. The director of the program will come say, oh, this is a very uh, uh, beautiful class, interesting class. You will love the class. What is all interesting about? Out of 20 yoga teachers training student, there are four or five of them are men. When you see some men in the yoga teachers training, that becomes a very interesting class. Now, when you are trying to give me the answers, let me start a little discussion before we do the practice. We've been practicing but most of the practices, as you know, that we pick and choose from our daily routine. That is called the yoga therapy. Yoga therapy is the adaptation of the yoga practice, adaptation of the yoga philosophy based on the patient's or client's clinical condition. So we'll be pick and choose and will tell you what you need to do during different conditions. Now, this will be a little bit of a discussion because uh, I want you to get the understanding. And as you know, this class is primarily for a yoga therapy practitioner, yoga therapy teachers, healthcare providers. So I'll be using, connecting a lot of physiology, a, yoga therapy, Ayurveda, and Western medicine. We call it a healthy convergence. Now let's go back to see in our life. If you look in our life, yes, the women in our even home, our daughter, my wife, our mother, grandmother, they're always, always, always in charge of our health and well-being. Even when you have a disease, even when you are taking a medication, or, or even when you are following a, some guidance from a physician, 
guess what? The women in the house takes care of it most of the time. I'm saying most of the time, you know, I'm not saying men, men is also there. So, what we find out from our research and experience? The women goes through a lot of physiological processes. Remember, these are physiological processes. And always remember there is a difference between a man and women physiological process. Remember in our Western medicine, we used to treat everybody. Men, women, doesn't matter, even children and different races, same thing, same medication, or just like a standardized medicine. Oh, children, so, okay, cut down the dosage based on the, the body weight. Women, yes, oh, maybe in a smaller women, give it a little smaller doses. But we find out what works in men doesn't work in women, or what works in women doesn't work in men that much. So, maybe about half a century back, or maybe a little later, we started, it's called a gender-specific medicine. Yes, women are different physiologically, so there has to be a different medical system for gender. Slowly and slowly we came up, then it came into the ethnicity. We find it out, the medication works from this ethnic group, doesn't work in the other ethnic group. So, we had a ethnic based medicine, race based medicine, whatever you say, we know this medicine works for this, this doesn't work for that. Slowly and slowly we come to the point today, I don't know if you know the term now, today is called a precision medicine. Precision medicine is basically, we call it a, like pharmacogenomics, like medication, drugs based on your genetics. Nutrigenomics, nutrition based on your genetics. The precision medicine is based on your genetics, which is becoming an individualized medicine. In our yoga and Ayurveda, it has been described in thousands and thousands of years back, that every individual is different. Every individual has a different body type. Vata, Pitta and Kapha. You may have a diabetes, but according to our yoga therapy in Ayurveda, you could have a Vata diabetes, you could have a Pitta diabetes, you could have a Kapha diabetes. And the treatments are different. Genetics does not cause a disease, it's called genetic expression, gene has to express. And gene is expressed due to a phenomena called epigenetics. And yoga therapy is nothing but a epigenetics. So for women, when the woman is born, the woman starts to have a, a menstrual period when the time comes start to have a breast development, then have a monthly menstrual cycle, then they go for the pregnancies, during pregnancies they have a lactation, the milk form in the breast, so the baby is having mother's milk. There is a lot of time that they have a lot of issues within the menstrual period, they have a cramping pain, they call it dysmenorrhea. Dys means painful, menorrhea is a period. Dysmenorrhea is there. There is a premenstrual syndrome. Like before the menstruation starts, they have a lot of physiological changes. And that is all being described very well. Then they start having the menstruation start to stop then they go to a phase of called menopause and during menopause they also have some symptoms a lot of hot flushes, a lot of endocrine changes 
So all this phenomena which takes place in the women is all based on called altered hormonal homeostasis. What is altered hormonal homeostasis means they have a change in the hormone and this hormone is creating all the phenomena in the women starting from beginning of the menstruation with the development of the breast with the pregnancies during your even menstrual cramps and even in the menopause practice of yoga therapy corrects the altered hormonal homeostasis corrects the hormonal changes or hormonal imbalances the hormone going up and down is not being sort of stable for the women and we know the pathway pathway is called limbic system limbic system we call it emotional brain this is beyond our call a cortex sensory and motor brain and limbic system when it gets activated through a two nuclei called amygdala and hippocampus amygdala responds to fear hippocampus responds to memory it sends a signal to hypothalamus signals are sent to neurotransmitter primary is called a dose dopamine oxytocin serotonin and endorphin hypothalamus again sends a signal through called your releasing hormones to pituitary gland and the pituitary gland that secretes the hormone called pituitary adrenal axis to the adrenal gland so for the hormones to be secreted from the pituitary gland say a female hormone luteinizing hormone uh, or even a growth hormone a hypothalamus sends a signal which is called growth hormone releasing factors so we know the your pathway and that is the really the answer that the women feels good women feels good within themselves doing a practice of yoga therapy and they stick to it and they continue you know people ask me all the time yeah how how do i know uh, i have a, a stillness of my mind how do i know i have a you know flexibility of my body my body is fluid my body is a you know in a, in a relaxation state a, a daily practice of yoga creates a called the effortless ease effortless ease means this is your life this is your living when you try to do something it fires back try not to be angry makes you more angry try not to be stress gives you more stress so the women it's called introspection looking inside is so it's called the awakening the doctor within you and we always say the disease is due to this age remember this is d i s space e a s e this is a treatment is called effortless ease and that's what the women are feeling so now you understand that if you tell a person or a person comes to you learns a practice of yoga and yoga therapy they are not going to stick to it unless they have the change and they have a transformation within them when they have a transformation within them when they feel they are going to stick to it. when you tell somebody to do something they are not going to do it they are not going to follow 
But they're going to do it when you make them feel how they feel. So the woman feels great with the yoga and yoga therapy practice. So now we understand why so many women are in the field of yoga. Second, I always hear my contraindications, what I do, what don't you do, what I don't do during pregnancy, what I don't do during uh, my menstrual period. If you do anything, suddenly and without paying attention to your body and mind, you are going to create a physiological stress to your body which is going to harm you. But if you practice a relaxation response, activation of parasympathetic tone, slowly and slowly you develop what is called a habit forming called neuroplasticity. When the neuroplasticity sets in, you are going to continue the practice daily and you are not going to leave home without doing it. Even it doesn't matter where you are. You are in the train, you are in the plane, you are in a hotel, you are in a friend's house, your own house, you are still going to continue your practice. Why? It happens to us. We do the same thing. It doesn't matter where you are. Even when the neuroplasticity sets in, if you don't do a practice one day, your body will remind you, hey, you have not done it today. So, a person who is practicing yoga, asana, pranayama, meditation, so starting from a young age, for him or her, that is their normal lifestyle. When they do a sit down, like this is called an easy pose, sukhasana, they feel, they feel good because they develop that neuroplasticity. I'm sitting here, I'm not sitting here. I've been sitting here a few times. I have the input in my brain. My brain is allowing me to sit down like this. So this is my normal physiology. With this, with this posture, there is no physiological changes in my body because I also started it in stages. So initially, so I always change my foot, I was changing my foot, I always change the other side. Initially, maybe I started from here. What are you looking for? No pain. No pain, effortless breathing. Any imbalance you create in your physical body, it affects your breath. It's called body sheet to the breath sheet. So if your breath is normal, if you're able to talk, able to sing during any postures, any asanas, your physiology is normal. So here I am and our physiology says after 20, 30, 40 input in my brain, I will get used to it, I'll be able to do a little bit more. Then slowly and slowly I'll be able to do it and this is my normal physiology. So if you're practicing a normal physiology and then the woman has a normal physiological changes, whether it is menstruation, whether it is a pregnancy, they'll be able to continue what they've been practicing before. There should not be any contraindication. Yes, there will be a contraindication. What are the contraindications? Yes, when they're pregnant, the uterus has a baby inside. You're not going to do any massaging of the abdominal organs, or you're not going to do a kapalbhati pranayama, or you're not going to do a abdominal lock or a root lock, which is going to create a little pressure and massage 
of the uterus for the uterus to contract. And this is not a, a scientific question, this is a normal common sense and anecdotes. But on the other hand, what are the practices women need to do? Let's start with the practice now. Talk to now. Yoga said if you massage the abdominal organ or if you massage any of the organ, organ functions better. As simple as it is. Okay, so like even when I tell everybody, even in our Western medicine, when my heart stops, cardiac stop, what do you do? We do chest compression. It's called a CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. What are you doing? We're massaging the heart for its function to come back. So, what we're going to do? We are going to do the massaging of the female organs uterus, tubes, and ovaries. The ovaries are secreting the hormones. So if you massage the ovaries, the ovaries are going to function better. There is a new, there is a big discussion, PCOD, polycystic, ovarian disease or PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Ovary has a multiple small cysts and creates all this. Massage the ovary. So we'll do the asanas who are going to massage the contents of our abdomen. A primary massaging asana will be your A. Mundukasan, frog pose. We start with the Vajrasan, thunderbolt, followed by Mundukasan, and followed by your Shashankasan, or a moon or rabbit pose. Why? The primary effect to quiet down the limbic system from which the hormonal imbalance, which is called altered hormonal homeostasis starts, is the parasympathetic activation and the relaxation response. Most powerful parasympathetic activation and relaxation is your Vajrasana, thunderbolt. So, number one concept. So you will do all the relaxation asanas, relaxation of the bigger muscles and relaxation with the, your pranayam. So we will do Vajrasana, Mandukasana, Shashankasana. Then the massaging is done when the pelvis is grounded and the pelvis is a little bit more active. So think about it. the asanas we do. See, we pick and choose. You are picking and choosing. Or, or you are trying to improve the pelvic floor function because pelvic floor function and pelvic floor dysfunction is very common in women. And most of the reason physiological processes is your childbirth and also the, the, the bladder, the urinary bladder and the urethra that is very small. So they get a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction. Pelvic floor dysfunction, I'll show you that the practice, that practice will be your wide angle forward bend is called prasharita uttanasana 
along with Kapalbhati Pranayama. In the Kapalbhati Pranayama, you massage all the pelvic floor. Also, when you can sit down like a butterfly, Tidliyasana, what you call a Supta, this is called a Baddha Gunasana or a Tidliyasana, this is going to be your, for that, women's health. You will be doing the squatting pose, Malasana. You'll be doing very small, like a, the relaxation asana, relaxation of your hands, relaxation of your wrist, your shoulder, your neck, which you do all the time, every, every time of practice. So I'm just telling you how to pick and choose. So the grounding of the pelvis, massaging of your abdominal content. Think about it. You face down. You are doing, say, Makarasan. Makarasan is your crocodile. Or we call it TV viewing pose. We will do a TV viewing pose. Or the cobra pose, Bhujangasan. Pelvis is grounded at times. So we are massaging here. A locust, Shalabhasan. Feet up. And the face up, you can do your knee chest, Pavan Muktasana, and your spinal twist, call your Markadasana. Okay, let's start. Then we'll come a step by step what you can do for a different women's physiological condition. For example, if you have a small breast, it's called macromesia. What are the yogic practice you do for a small breast? If you have a larger breast, it's called macromesia. What do you do for a larger breast? Even men, men can develop a breast tissue which is called gynecomastia. What do you do for gynecomastia? Okay. So, the first practice will be able to sit down in a Vajrasana. And always remember, you can do all in your chair also. Chair is there, I have always chair in the back. And yoga therapy is starting from where you are. Yoga therapy is non-competitive. You don't compete with anybody. Yoga therapy is no adjustment. Nobody adjusts my body. Alignment will come to me. Body is a hardware, mind is a software. So I will just gently sit down in a, on my, the way we do Vajrasana, slowly sit down on your hill and you spread your feet apart. When you are able to sit down in this asana for some time, and people ask me all the time, oh, I cannot sit down this, what should I do? You don't have to. What do you do? You start where you are. Where you are? Can you, can you sit this far? Can you this far? Okay. Pick a pen. Keep pillow, put it underneath and you sit down where you have a comfortable discomfort. If you still have a pain here, you still cannot sit down here, okay? Let's do one more tricks. Take one more. I have one, I'm putting now two, I'm putting two, comfortable. When neuroplasticity sets in, 
20, 30, 40 input, I slowly take out one. I have one more left. And then what I do personally in this posture, I do it, I keep on putting your a folded blanket. Why do I do a folded blanket? With a folded blanket, what you can do, you can take out the layers at a time, slowly and slowly, you will come down. Next question about this asana. They're very important asana, especially for women. And that's what I'm saying. Next one, I get always hear a complaint that I have a issue under my ankle here. What should I do? What you can do, you can roll. Like if you have a uh, yoga mat, I don't have a thick yoga mat, but yeah, I have a one yoga mat here. Anyway, you can roll a yoga mat and put it let me show you what I'm talking about. You put it under your ankle. If you can see me, see this one we put here in between, you're sitting on your hips like this. Very comfortable. In fact, this asana, it creates a profound level of relaxation, response, and activation of parasympathetic tone. I am insisting on this asana because this is an asana for women's health. This is an asana for your digestive system, for digestion. You are what you eat. Not really. You are what you digest. So, the biggest complaint I hear about is the underneath this ankle. So you can put it underneath your ankle. Or you can roll it up a little bit. Maybe a little softer one. Put it under your ankle. And then you sit down. So the first one was under my hip. This is under my ankle. And then you start slowly in stages. And when you start stages, next thing I hear about all the time, how long I'm going to be in this asana. You are going to be here with the effortless ease. The moment you have any symptoms, primarily with your breathing, as long as you can sit down in this asana, you can talk, you can sing, it's okay, sit down. This is a normal physiological process. When you start, you will start with about, say, between five to ten breaths. And always remember, we always teach you that yogic breathing. Yogic breathing is breathing out first because lung is like a balloon. It has a 4.5 liter capacity. We only breathe 500 cc, 0.5 liter. Our lung has about 80 to 90 percent reserve. So I'm sitting here, I'm sitting in a Vajrasana. I have a lot of issue in my right knee. I've seen the doctors. I have what's called a, a supra patellar bursitis. It's an inflammation of a bursa above the patella, and it's here. It's here for months and months, years and years. And uh, I pay attention. I don't do anything crossing the level of my pain, the sort of pain I do. So once you're comfortable sitting here, then you massage the abdominal organs and primarily 
during your non-pregnant time. Try not to do it when you are pregnant. Especially also remember, pregnancy has a three trimesters. Trimester means three months. It's a nine months pregnancy. First trimester, second trimester, third trimester. The first trimester, you have a little bit of a careful. But also remember, the pregnancy also is a normal physiological process. We as a physician, we are trying to uh, make it a, a pathological issue. It's not a pathology, it's a normal physiology for a women's health. So first, when you do the Mandukasan, massaging all that we will call, you take your one hand, left hand, level of belly button, other hand in the top, breathe out first, take a little breath in, completely breathe out, suck your stomach in and hold a little bit, and slowly come down and keep on breathing. Don't stop breathing. Breathing out longer than breathing in and you stay in this posture. Stay in this posture from five to ten breath. I'm showing you that when you practice you will stay in the posture. And if any anything you think about massaging this organ, these are called your Udar Karshan. Udar is your stomach, massaging your stomach. Then you can do your Adhimudra. Child's fist, the way the child does it. Hand mudra. It's very relaxing. You put the Adhi Mudra here, level of the belly button, the gain, breathe out first, take a deep breath in, completely breathe out and slowly come down. If you're doing with me, see slowly come down and you listen to your body's signal. First signal is no pain, then is an effortless breathing. If you feel any pain in this posture, you back off. But find a posture where there is no pain and stay in the posture with the eyes closed, breathing out longer than breathing in. As simple as count of two in, count of four out. Two to five to ten breath and slowly and slowly your whole body will come down and touch the head on the ground and you stay. Stay here doing your breathing. Very, very important for women's health. Next, the quieting down the limbic system, that means quieting down your mind. The asana which quiets down your mind is your rabbit pose or the moon pose, Shashanka asana. Why? You look at a rabbit. Rabbit is running around. Suddenly stops, boom, it goes to Shashanka There are a lot of ways you can do Shashanka You can do your head down, close to your knees, and slowly and slowly raise your body high up. But the simplest way is from here, put your hands all the way out, touch your Hand goes all the way out, elbows comes in the ground, slowly put your head down and keep breathing. Breathing out longer than breathing in. When you get up, it's very relaxed. You slowly get up, one step at a time.
mind is very important and I get some questions How do I get the stillness of your mind? How long I have to do to get my mind still? You don't try. You don't even try to do asana. Asana will come to you. You don't try. You don't try to do to don't try to do the stillness of your mind. Oh, when I'm doing it, my eyes closed, have all the thought comes in. Let them come. Thoughts will come, thoughts will go. Slowly and slowly you will see your thought process get more organized. Chattering of your mind goes away. Your hormonal imbalance slowly and slowly goes away. Quieting down your mind is like metaphorically you can see when I'm looking at the sky and the cloud is coming. The cloud is coming in the sky. I cannot see the cloud, but I keep on gazing in the sky. The cloud comes and cloud goes away. Thoughts will come, thoughts will go away. Titliyasan. Madhukonasan, very important for women's health. Okay. A grounding posture and grounding asanas for your reproductive chakra. When you look at the chakras, the chakras are yogic concept of balancing different organ system of your body. Seven chakras coming from the top down. Top is your crown chakra, Shadhisthan chakra connected to your nervous system. There are some practices, asana, pranayam, mudras, bandhas, so these are all to balance the chakra. Six chakra is in the third eye between eyebrows, Agha chakra, connected to your endocrine system. Fifth chakra at the level of your throat, connected to respiratory system. Like a pranayama, you know, ujjayi pranayama, that will affect your throat chakra. Fourth chakra is a heart chakra, color is green, connected to cardiovascular system. Third chakra is your solar plexus chakra, or Monipur chakra, connected to your gastrointestinal system. And the second chakra is your pelvic chakra. Shadhisthan chakra connected to the productive system. So the second chakra needs to be balanced for women's health. And then comes the first chakra, or the root chakra, that is connected to your musculoskeletal system, bones, joints, and the muscles. Another very important for the women's health is to create the balance, balancing poses, very, very important. So here you see both of my knees are all the way down, touching the ground. My spine is straight, looking straight, I'm talking, I'm breathing, I'm totally effortless. So if I've been doing it this completely effortlessly, I have a normal physiology. I have not stressed any of my physiological system. So if I'm a woman and if I'm in my menstrual period now, there is no reason for not doing it. 
hear all the time, oh, don't do a, uh, 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 your uh, shoulder stand, your plow, your head stand, uh, when you're menstruating, when you're menstruating. Yes, don't do it. If you are going to start it right now. But if you're not going to start right now, I know I have shown it to you how to start a headstand. You do in stages. You do in stages and do it slowly. So here, I'm very comfortable. This is also called a butterfly, is it? Titliasa. A very important balancing. Remember the balancing is your balancing your hormones, balancing your autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is balanced during the abnormal physiological changes. And most important the physiological changes will arise during your menopause. In the menopause, when you see the hot flushes, when you see the menopausal changes, that is primarily due to imbalance of your autonomic nervous system and your imbalance of your hormonal system. So what is being prescribed at the time from the Western medical perspective? We use a lot of medication which is going to quieting down your mind. All the psychotropic medications are used. A lot of your which the hormones which can increase or decrease your estrogen level, progesterone level, those will be used. So now a balancing asana, this is called your yeah, Vaisa asana, very simple balancing asana, like you put your one knee in the top of one and you are sitting it down. This is like a cow or a buffalo. Now remember the yogis looked at the nature and they named the asanas. So they look at the nature, a buffalo or a cow, when they sit down, they will cross the, the front, both of their front leg like this and they sit down. From here, you can progress slowly as a balancing asanas. What is balancing asana? That is called a gobukhasana asana, cow face. This is also the beginning of cow face because when you look at it metaphorically, this looks like a face of a cow. So that's where the name cow face came from. So when you're sitting comfortably in this posture, so what is a balancing pose? You need to switch it back and you need to put the other one on the top. And you see, you will always see that it is a little different in both sides. Why? Because you are lateralized. I am right handed, right footed, or I am left handed, left footed. You are always comfortable the side of the brain which is acting more. So to create a balance in your autonomic nervous system, to create a balance in your hormonal regulation, what is the altered hormonal homeostasis, you are going to create the balancing poses. Next thing what would happen when you are practicing, remember you will go in stages again. You will go first, there is no pain, there is effortless breathing, so initially maybe your feet is here, it is okay. No pain, it's here, then after a few weeks it will come here, and slowly and slowly you will be able to sit down here. Then when you see that your one side is more comfortable than the other side, what you are going to do, you are going to do a little longer practice on the side you are less comfortable. When you do longer on the less comfortable, you will be in a state that you will be in a state of comfort. We call it a comfortable discomfort equally on both sides. You will feel same. 
Remember, there is no physiological changes. You have done it in gradual in stages. You can talk, you can breathe. The way you feel it here, you will feel exactly the same way when you do this. And this will be more evident when you do the your cow face, Gomukhasan. When you do Gomukhasan, you will see your one side is easier than the other side. But when you are in balance, you will see your both sides you will be able to do equally and you feel in the same level of comfort in both sides. So let's try to do it one time this powerful balancing asana and show it to you how to do it. Okay, here I am. I'm sitting here. My right knee is the top of my left knee. My left hand comes here I hold it to my elbow, I stabilize my left hand, and then I take my right hand high up, drop my right hand, I hook it, and slowly and slowly I even handshake each other. I may feel a little bit of discomfort, but initially when you cannot do it, you can use a, a strap or you can use a, a handkerchief and if you are holding it slowly and slowly you pull it down you have to come here and come to the state of your hand shaking each other and your level of comfort. Now in the same context what we will do I am changing my foot now I am putting my left knee on the top I'm putting my left knee at the top, my left hand is going to go higher. Left hand going to go higher, right hand is here. I'm stabilizing my right hand in the middle. Left hand comes down, it touches, it hooks, and slowly I'm hand shaking each other. I'm in a level of comfort in both sides equally. And for you who is going to start, even if you cannot reach each other, you will see your one side is easier than the other side. So the same practice same practice we do, we are not bringing out any new asanas, new pranayamas, we will be doing exactly the same practice we do daily. We have a chart for our daily practice that is called your dinocharya. We pick and choose from our dinocharya. Why? I do the same practice every day and I have overcome all the chronic diseases I had within me. I see a practice, I see the practices all of you guys do, you do excellent practice. I bow my hand to all of you, you are such a wonderful, you know, yoga teacher, yoga therapy teachers, but you bring different things all the time. Remember one thing, that is not going to be sustainable. What is sustainable? Sustainable is what you are going to feel. So if you if you are going to like say the asanas for the pelvis grounding. So pelvic grounding asanas will be always remember move this chair here. we call the pelvic health. A pelvic health comes 
also from your a squatting pose called malasana. So here I am, I'm in the malasana. See what it is, I have a relaxation. My feet is relaxed, my ankle is relaxed, my knee is relaxed, my hip, my back, my whole body relaxes. But it also relaxes my pelvic floor. It, it relaxes the whole area here. It improves your pelvic floor function. I see the practices after practices for the women's health, the pelvic floor dysfunction. For the hand, you put your hand, separate your fingers, you relax your hand. Extend your wrist, you relax your wrist. Put your one elbow inside, other elbow inside, slowly bring your hand close to you. Spine is straight, eyes are closed, you are closing your eyes, you're doing it. It's a wonderful practice. From here, you get up without a support. When you get up in the support, what you need to do, the women develops a more constipation than men. It's a normal physiological process. So you do the asanas to improve your proper elimination. It's called in Sanskrit called a Lobhu Shankha Praksala. Lobhu means <coughs> your less. Shankha is the metaphor, you say, of your abdomen or intestine, and Praksala means cleaning. The first one is your balancing poses, and then your cleaning your proper intestine. In the balancing poses, what you have there, you are comfortable standing with your feet separate. In the balancing poses, you put your feet together. So this is our daily practice. We are not doing anything different. But that is what you need for the women's health. When you stand here, it's a karasana, your ear, your shoulder, your hip, and the ankle in the same line. Slowly, you can raise your hand high up and you feel the whole body is completely straight. In fact, you are against the wall, your whole body will be against the wall. I do it every single morning. What I do, I will get up, I will put my, I will put my ankle here, slowly I touch my hips, I touch my shoulders, back of my head, I can pull the hands high up, I'm standing here. Powerful balance pose. So, when you are having a fit, put your fit together. That's a balancing pose. Upward mountain pose, clasp your hand. Remember when you relax, your finger goes in and out. It's not an issue. Very nice. Clasp your hand, put it over your head. Breathe out first, take a deep breath in, and slowly get into your toes and the hand high up. Upward mountain pose. This is one of the five asanas for your Shankha Praksala. 
proper elimination within the city. Oblique mountain pose, hands high up, breathe out first, take a deep breath in and slowly put your body on one side. And stay, stay in the asana, your eyes closed, you're doing a breathing, breathing out longer than breathing in. Same way, breathe out first, take a deep breath in and go on the opposite side. What is interesting with this asana is that physiologically looks like you are working here but affects here. It massages all the abdominal organs. In fact, it helps propelling your intestinal content and also helps massaging the female organs, uterus, tubes and ovaries. You are massaging this part, remember, all these all this organs are here, so you do it, call Kati Chakra Asana, West Rotation Poses. West Rotation Pose you can do in two ways, you separate your feet, your hands on both sides, your left hand goes back, right hand comes on your right shoulder, you breathe out first, Take a deep breath in, slowly turn your body all the way to the back. Keep on breathing, breathing out longer than breathing in and slowly bring your body in the middle. Opposite now, right hand goes to the back, left hand comes over your right shoulder, breathe out first, take a deep breath in and all the way to the back. You can do the same Kodi Chakra Asana with the hands in the front. You put in the hands in the front, you breathe out first, take a deep breath in, slowly move your hands all the way to the back, and the same breathing cycle you come back in the middle. You breathe in here, and breathe out all the way to the back and same breathing cycle you come back in the middle. Next you close your eyes with the eyes closed following your breath. It becomes so relaxing asanas that it becomes almost like you call a moving meditation. Breathing out first, taking a deep breath in slowly breathing out, going to the back. A body's health doesn't matter whether it is men, men, women, a health is defined. In yoga it's called a sit rise test. When you're able to get up without a support and sit down without a support, that is your health. So balancing it, you can cross your feet, look at how beautiful it is, cross your feet. You sit down comfortably, 
and get up without any support. You feel great, you feel wonderful. But the opposite side. If you're going with me, try. Opposite side. Slowly go down. When you practice the balancing poses, your hands and the eyes also helps you in balance. Remember when you fall down, what will happen? Your hand will fall down first to protect you. In fact, you get a special fracture. It's called a colis fracture. Fracture in your wrist when you fall down. So take your hands away. You can take it out. It's called a baddha hastasana. Right hand hold on to your left arm. Left hand hold on to your right arm. I'm right handed, right footed, see if I can stand on my left foot and then how long, keep on counting, 10 seconds, that's good, 20 seconds, you started getting younger, 40 seconds, more and more younger, then when you close your eyes and you can stand up, to overcome any of your physiological changes. Very important for women. Eyes closed, standing on one feet, and hand is on the back. I practice every single day, still. I'm not that stable. I'm a human being, that's why. To the opposite, now use the left hand to hold the right arm, right hand holding the left arm. And back here slowly. Now see if I can stand on my right foot. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, minute, Close my eyes, see what happens. Close my eyes, I'm standing with my eyes closed. Same process, you'll be here longer, longer time. One side will be easier than the other side. And you'll be practicing it. The side which you feel a little uncomfortable, doing it long. But remember when you're practicing, there is no physiological changes. How do you know? No pain and effortless breathing. I exercise, I walk, I run, I do my treadmill, but wherever I am, my breath is essentially normal. Even when I started doing my cardiac rehab after my open heart surgery, started doing it faster because the cardiologist asked you, go a little faster, you know, at three months, four months, five months, raise it up 5%, 10%. They want to see the stress test. That's okay. There's that stress for your heart, but not for your practice. So I lower it down. Come to three miles an hour, five percent grade, three miles an hour, ten percent grade, three miles an hour, fifteen percent grade. I'm fine, my breathing is normal. Increasing three point five miles to fifteen percent grade, my breathing is still normal after a while. Takes time, takes time, but what do you get used to? So I'm now at 3.54 miles an hour, 10 to 15 percent gradient on a treadmill, I'm fine because body get used to. So for the pelvic floor dysfunction, this is a wonderful practice. So you all know about called Kapalbhati Pranayama. Kapalbhati Pranayama is a balloon here, the diaphragm here, 
the balloon here. If you squeeze the balloon back here, this hits the diaphragm, hits the lung, air comes out. Simple technique is Generally, when you start practicing pranayama, you do not do practice pranayama standing up. Because in a standing up, what happens? Your get a little bit of altered sense of consciousness because of the wash away of carbon dioxide, it develops some effect of hyperventilation in any pranayama practice. But after a while, like us, when you're doing it for a longer and longer time, this is our normal physiological process. We can do pranayama standing up, pranayama laying down, pranayama sitting down, we can do pranayama, you can do it here. It's not going to affect me. But if you start doing it, it will affect you. So start, please, don't do any pranayama standing up. Same way, the Spreading, touching your head to the ground totally changes your physiological process. When your head comes below your heart, your pressure in the brain goes higher, called CSF, cerebrospinal pressure goes up, pressure in the eye goes higher, pressure in the carotid goes higher. So body's homeostasis and healing process comes in. When the homeostasis comes in, then you get to call a baroreceptor sensitivity goes higher. Chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptor is the receptor which sensitizes your, your changes in your blood, blood pH. So chemoreceptor sensitivity goes down. And in a profound level of balancing, homeostasis. Then when you incorporate a Kapalbhati Pranayama, you will see you are massaging the whole pelvic floor. I am going to show it to you, if you are doing with me, or if you can do with me, you can feel the pelvic floor. Now, when you come down, you do call a supported forward bend, you put your hand on the thigh and slowly keep coming down. For us, it will be very easy for our head to come down on the ground, not an issue. But people who are starting it, so what we'll tell them to do, you do a supported forward bend, find a place to support. Suppose you cannot do too far, if you can say, it's a kitchen counter, I can go ahead and come down and slowly put my head here on a kitchen counter, and I'm in a profound level of relaxation. Then what you do, as I said gradually, come down here. The head down, keep separating your feet. And when you're comfortable, you do a Kapalabhati Pranayama. And put your hand in your pelvis. You'll see the pelvic floor getting massaged. If you're practicing for a while, what you can do, you can separate your feet, see how far it goes down, then slowly put your head down. When your head comes, touches the ground, your feet, you can separate your feet up to almost the width of the mat, or you can hold a little bit more, put your hands here, and you can make a part of the pranayama. And if you put a hand in your pelvic floor, there cannot be a better asana and pranayama practice for women's health than this, called Prasharita Uttanasana, 
कोई कपाल भाती प्राणायाम सो वंडरफुल प्रैक्टिस इज आल्सो गुड फॉर मेन मेन विथ ए प्रोस्टेट प्रॉब्लम मेन विथ ए प्रोस्टेट प्रॉब्लम दिस इज ए वेरी गुड आसन other asanas which are regarding massaging here grounding the pelvis which you do all the time so, so if you want to see a couple of them which you know say makarasan when you do makarasan i can do sideways okay let me show it in the front so you will be able to see it hopefully you put your hand down you can put your one hand on the top and put your head on one side breathe in and out you get prof- profoundly grounded and very well relax get the opposite side for the grounding if you can see how beautiful the grounding works it's your or tv viewing pose your elbows hand you're watching the television look how grounding is my pelvis and in my abdominal area eyes are closed This asana, as you all know, so I don't, I don't have to show it to you too much. But or or if you want to see a, say, a very simple, uh, a cobra pose, get up into a cobra pose, and then it's called a Tirjak Bhujangasana. Separate your feet up to the width of the mat, and look over your left shoulder towards the right ankle. and slowly come down the gate on the top look over your right shoulder towards your left hand you can do your locust lot of asanas you can do and think about it grounding your pelvis your knee chest spinal twist makarasan but most important obviously is your pranayama and the bandhas so what are the important pranayamas important pranayama remember we're massaging all the abdominal organs so what will be the massaging kapalbhati pranayama i have a whole series of pranayama practice they're all in the youtube you can go to my youtube channel and you see all them pranayama is in practice with your hand mudras this is your dhanu mudra quieting down your mind and this is your vayu mudra quieting down your vata quieting your pain so the women who has your premenstrual syndrome premenstrual syndrome is primarily is a vata disorder it could be it could be pitta and kapha but primarily vata disorder so you will be doing this mudra a kapalbhati pranayama premenstrual syndrome you will be doing alternate nostril breathing on ulom vilom pranayama if you have a pain 
if you have a pain with premenstrual syndrome, if you have a cramping of the uterus, cramping pain, then you will also do Bastrika Pranayama. As you know, Bastrika Pranayama is the pain relieving pranayama. Relieves pain by washing away your lactic acid, pyruvic acid, and pain producing substances. It's called a Shunda Mudra. To improve your hearing. Prithvi Mudra is a grounding for obesity and diabetes. This is your Varun Mudra. Okay? So if you come back and see that the chakra, the pelvic chakra, where the reproductive organs are connected, the main element is a water. Out of all the seven chakras, the root chakra is your earth. Pelvic chakra is your water. Your solar plexus chakra is your fire. Heart is your air. Throat chakra is your space. Sixth chakra is your mind. Seven chakra is your spirit. Body, mind and spirit. Seven chakras. So touching your little finger and thumb is a Varun Mudra. So women's health will primarily be doing your Vayu Mudra, Varun Mudra, then you also do is called Shakti Mudra or Prana Mudra. It balances all the imbalances in your body. Apna Mudra is also important for women, but Apna Mudra it also balances your downward forces. So if you have a menorrhagia, like have a more blood coming during menstrual period, you'll be doing Kapalvati Pranayama with your, your Apna Mudra. So let's show you a sample. You'll be doing Kapalvati Pranayama. I've done it so many times with you. So let's do about 20 counts each, but only the mudra specifically for women's health. The first, you do a Vayu Mudra, bend your index finger down, put your hand over your knees, eyes closed, spine straight, and just bring your awareness to belly button and push it back and let the air come out. The Varun Mudra, which is connected to your pelvic chakra, and you keep on doing it, let me tell you the benefit. Again, close your eyes, spine straight, very gently, one per second, massaging all the internal organs, massaging your uterus, massaging your tubes. Massaging your ovaries, massaging all the abdominal contents. Very important pranayama for infertility. If you have infertility, tubes are not functioning, ovaries are not functioning, uterus is not functioning. So many examples of women who are infertile started doing Kapalvati Pranayama and they conceived their babies. Shakti Mudra or Prana Mudra, little finger, ring finger, and thumb.
People with PCOD, this is the therapy. People with hormonal imbalance, this is the therapy. Why? It is massaging your ovaries. And the upper mudra, middle finger, ring finger and thumb. Abdominal lock, Agni Kriya, and the root lock. Chin lock, chin lock also. Remember chin lock? It's a <clears throat> breath holding and in inhalation. Hold the breath and put your chin down. That's called Mursha Pranayam. Breath holding and in inhalation. Need for your people have a smaller breast. The women who had a smaller breast call a micromesia. They need to do chest opening poses like your like a camel pose, ustrasan or laying down you do the uh, setu bandhasan. The bridge pose or doing a, your cobra pose those are for, and then breath holding and inhalation and hold, Abhantar in Kumbhak. People with larger breast called your macromestia. So most of the, remember, most of the tissue in the breast is a fatty tissue. The glandular tissue is very small. When the breast becomes large, it becomes large because of your fatty tissue. So think what will be the therapy. What is going to burn your fat? It's an open question to all of you. So I'll come back, and then I'll give you an answer. See if I get the answer. A larger breast has mostly primarily a fatty tissue. And what will be the yogic therapy to burn that fat? So abdominal lock, but before that, the primary is a root lock. Because root lock is that you breathe out first, take a deep breath in, breathe out, pull your whole pelvis high up, including your anal sphincter, and for the women also, your whole pelvic floor, pull it up, and the massage, massage the whole pelvic organ. In Western medicine, we call it a Kegel maneuver. Kegel maneuver, we use it for called urinary incontinence, urinary incontinence. And urinary incontinence we use for your Varun Mudra. Vurun mudra is used for your urinary incontinence when you cannot hold the urine. It balances. In fact, it, it also helps you when holding the urine if you cannot go on time. So, you breathe out first. Take a deep breath in. Completely breathe out. Contract your pelvic floor and pull it up and hold. Next maneuver you can do, you contract your inner sphincter, your pelvic flinter, these are called levator ni, puborectalis muscles, and keep pushing high up and massaging. It will be like 
See, when I'm doing a Kapalbhati Pranayama, I'm doing here, I'm pulling my pelvic floor up. So see how beautiful practice this is. Try this. Kapalbhati Pranayama, and then contract the anal sphincter pelvic floor and pull it up. I can see my abdomen is going in and my whole pelvic floor is raising higher. Wonderful practice. You can do abdominal lock and uh, your Adnisar Kriya. Very good for women. So, first you will be Breathing out first. Take a deep breath in, blow it out, and do start the both at the same time. Very important practice. We have the whole section prenatal yoga, intranatal yoga, postnatal yoga, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy. Remember, pregnancy is a physiological process with the altered hormonal changes. You do not want to do any sudden physiological changes during your pregnancy. So if you want to do pregnancy, you will do in the, a, a relaxing asanas, a relaxing asanas, and a very gentle, we call it a shuksma bayam, the very mild relaxing asanas of the hands, like your shoulder, your neck, and do it very simply sitting down. Do not cross your limit. On the other hand, I've seen it multiple times, multiple times. A woman who is being a yoga practitioner almost their whole life and a daily yoga practitioner. They get pregnant as if nothing has happened to them. Even in the second trimester, third trimester, I see they're doing a you know, seated forward bend, they're doing a, you know, hand touching the feet, they're doing the pranayama practice. Guess what? They're working until the last day. They go to have a baby, they go to the middle of the night with the baby, because of their baby they lay down, they relax their pelvic floor, they do the breathing, and They're home in a few hours, you know, early in the morning, they're home with the baby. I've seen, I've seen multiple times. We have also seen, and this is also research, that the women who are practicing the daily practice of yoga, they have a less, during, during labor, less petrosin drip. Petrosin drip is given to contract your uterus so the labor process can start. They do not need too much Petra syndrome. They have less epidural. Epidural is given during the childbirth to get rid of the, the pain the, of the contraction of the uterus for the baby to be pushed out. They need less epidural less petrosin drip, almost no anal analgesics. But only when you remember, 
It is not going to happen that when you're pregnant, you are starting doing your asanas and pranayamas, you say, hey, I'm going to have an uneventful uh, childbirth. As childbirth is physiological, your daily yoga practice is physiological, and a longer and longer time of physiological practice, childbirth has become a normal physiological process. The moment you are not in the physiological process, then the childbirth, childbirth becomes a pathology, a whole pregnancy, and a whole menstrual period, and all the dysmenorrhea, metromedia, menarche, everything you name about women becomes a your pathology. If yoga practice converts or prevents the physiology become a pathology. Very, very important concept. People have a dysmenorrhea, the pain during period, pain is during primary, the contraction which causes pain, the primary is the massaging the uterus. Kapalvati pranayama, abdominal lock, Nisar Kriya, and that is also for your fibroid of the uterus. When you have the fibroid of the uterus, you use that. I, as I said, there is no contraindication if you are following a physiological process, but at least, at least when you are pregnant, the first three months, you have to be careful and you have to be sensible. Remember, this is your body. This is your pregnancy. Common sense is really the super sense. Be careful in the first three months. Second three months is great. Nothing will happen in second three months. If you're doing it before, but don't try, don't start anything which will change your physiology. If you want to do, don't do a Kapalbhati Pranayama during your pregnancy, but you do a very simple alternate nostril breathing. Or very simple, your Bastrika Pranayama. Or even a Ujjayi Pranayama. Mm -hmm. Very good practice for your during pregnancy. Third trimester obviously is very stable. And as I said, I have noticed, I have seen yoga practitioner even third trimester, they're doing everything. Now, miscarriage, a loss of pregnancy takes place. Especially it takes place more in elderly primary like when you are pregnant at a little, we call it advanced age. Advanced age generally we talk about elderly primaries past 35. When you pass 35 years and if you become pregnant, the chance of having a little bit of more miscarriages is high. Not even high, it is very high. For first trimester, first three months, the miscarriage rate is almost 25, 30%. Can you prevent it? Maybe, may not be. But what happens when a miscarriage takes place and if you're doing a practice of yoga, your mind shifts and says, oh, you know, I was doing this. I was doing that, that caused it. No, you have not done anything. That is a normal percentage of miscarriages in an elderly time. So, the rule of thumb during pregnancy is don't start anything unusual which is going to create an imbalance in your physiological process. Looking for pain, look effortless breathing, and your practice will be as comfortable as it is. Huffing and puffing 
is good to build your strength and stamina. It's called a hypoxia. Hypoxia is good, good. Hypoxia, in fact, helps you build your muscle strength, strength and stamina. But this is not good for your physiological process, like even your, during menstruation, during your pregnancy. So don't do any huffing and puffing. You're doing a practice yoga practice as if you are talking, you are singing, you are enjoying. You know, you're, this is like a, a relaxation, like here I'm doing. I have a saliva in my mouth, my mouth is wet. That is the practice you need to do. If you're doing a practice in a mouth, I see the woman is doing a practice and have a, 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 a bottle of you know, uh, water and the drinking. Oh, I need to drink a little water. When you're drinking a little water, that means you are in a sympathetic overdrive. That you're having a dry mouth. That is not the practice you need. So, for a non-pregnant woman, for the, the another practice is called your great lock, Mahabha. You will start with your root lock, start with your abdominal lock, then start with chin lock. In a chin lock, you keep your neck straight high up, but put your chin down, bring your chin close to your chest. Use a relaxing mudra, this is called Adhi mudra, thumb inside and close, put it over there. You breathe out first, take a deep breath in. Completely breathe out. Contract your pelvic floor and pull up. Suck your stomach in and hold. Drop your chin down close to your chest and stay in this posture. When you have a cramping pain, you do a, a bastrika pranayama, but you do the bastrika pranayama in stages. The way to do it, completely effortlessly, you will do 20 slow, 20 medium, and 20 fast. That is the one cycle, and then you will be doing more and more cycle based on your physiological condition. Every asana for you will feel like your samasana. Every asana will have a completely effortless breathing. Every asana pranayama practice you will have a you will have a saliva in your mouth. You're not going to be drinking water. See here I'm talking almost for two hours. I didn't touch any water, nothing. The mouth is still wet. Parasympathetic activation. So spine straight, eyes closed. I've shown it so many times. When you pull it down, you pull it down with a Adhi Mudra. Thumb inside and close. Very slow, 20. Let's see if you want to do with me and see how you do with one cycle. This is very good for your dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea means your painful menstruation. Here it comes, breathe out first, take a deep breath in,
you get medium pace, 20 of them, same vastrika, primarily for painful menstruation, dysmenorrhea. you do the rapid vestiga pranayama. Continue this cycle more and more you'll get better and better. Bastrika pranayama is very good to bring the physiology back in the body. Always remember, physiology, whole women's health is a normal physiological process based on your hormonal imbalance called altered hormonal homeostasis. You need to quiet down the limbic system, the Magdalian hippocampus, and things will happen. Alternate nostril breathing is extremely important for people with premenstrual syndrome, because premenstrual syndrome is primary heart disorder. We've done it so many times. Let's do it one more time. The left hand, put a dhyana mudra, or a gyanu mudra, Touch your tip of your index finger, put your right hand to close your right nostril. Breathe out through your left nostril first. Breathe in through your left nostril. Drop your hand down. Close your left nostril. Breathe out through your right nostril. Breathe in through your right nostril. Close your right nostril. Breathe out through your left nostril. You keep doing it, let me tell you the benefit of this pranayama. Left nostril is controlled by the right brain. Right brain is intuitive. Right brain is female. Right brain is cooling. Left nostril breathing is called Chandra Nari, Moon Energy, or called Aida Nari. Right nostril is controlled by the left brain. Left brain is analytical, left brain is male, left brain is your heating. Right nostril is called Surya Nari, Sun Energy, Heating, and is sympathetic. Right nostril breathing is sympathetic, left nostril breathing is parasympathetic. Activates both sides of the brain, brings a balance back, brings a balance of your, the altered hormonal changes. Next you can put your index finger and middle finger in the third eye and to bring a balance back you can use the left hand to hold into your right ear low. Bring, close your eyes, bring your awareness in your third eye and the alternate nostril breathing. Wonderful practice for women with your premenstrual syndrome and other menstrual abnormalities. As I said, during menopause, you will have a, your 
hot flashes, a lot of other menopausal symptoms. Also sometimes during your menopause you have a continuous bleeding. You get a, a bleeding, this looks like your menstrual bleeding and the word you use for a dysfunction uterine bleeding you do every test, every test is normal. There is no abnormality in the whole your reproductive system but still continue to bleed. Essentially the bleeding stops but in the process your hemoglobin goes down and you feel miserable. According to yoga now you get a pitta disorder, blood loss pitta, you will do asanas and turn into your belly button. The both poles, no carson. You will do cat, cat pose, marjarasan, which is geared toward your belly button. You will do bridge pose, lay down, because all the bridge pose you see, it is all centered in your belly button. You will do a camel pose, ustrasan, which is also towards your belly button. All the asanas related to your belly button is your pitta balancing asanas. Remember, all the asanas below the belly button is your water balancing. Asana is related to belly button is pitta balancing. Asana is related above the belly button is your kapha balancing. You will do sitali pranayam and sitkari pranayam, another called a shadanta pranayam. So the way to do it, you know, sitali and sitkari pranayama is that you, you know, there is a very cooling pranayam, very important for women with hot flushes, women with uh, your um, menopausal symptoms. It's cooling but it also balances. Women with menopausal symptoms will do alternate nostril breathing and for your menopausal symptoms, menorrhagia, you stick your tongue out, roll your tongue and breathe through your mouth. Remember, you never breathe through your mouth in a normal breathing. Because breathing through your mouth, the air will go to somewhere else, not in the lung. You have to always breathe through your nostril. But this is to cool you down. Close your mouth and breathe out through your nostril. With a four or five breathing, you'll feel a profound level of cooling. Very important pranayama for women. You can stick your tongue out, you can do through your teeth. Sit curry pranayama. Teeth is breathe through your teeth. We'll finish with a little bit of quieting down our mind breathing, which will do, which will do a, a breath-centered meditation, followed by a silent, alternate nostril breathing without closing our nostril. To finish, before you finish, we need to answer a question. I didn't forget it. Women with larger breast, with all the fatty tissue inside the breast, the therapy is your Kapalbhati Pranayam. Kapalbhati Pranayam ignites your Agni called Jatharagni. It helps converting Sapta, sapta Dhatu, Rasha Dhatu, Rakta Dhatu, Mamsha Dhatu, Medha Dhatu. Your plasma, red blood cell, muscle cell to the fatty cell. 
from the fatty cell it converts into your bones, nervous tissue and reproductive tissue. So the fat burning is your Kapalbhati Pranaya. Use your Dhyana Mudra or Gyana Mudra, touch your index finger and thumb, put it over both the knees, close your eyes and follow your breath. Your spine is straight, visualize your breath. First you're breathing out through your lower nostril. Visualize your breath coming in through your nostril. Visualize the air is getting filtered. We have a filtering mechanism inside your nostril. Nose is also a personal air conditioner. Outside air is warm, it's going to cool it down. And outside of our air is cool, it is going to warm it up. Air is going to the side of your nostril. <coughs> there are two bony prominences called turbinate. Turbinate guides your air. It puts a little streamline and there is a tremendous amount of air flow through your nostril when you do your breathing. Then it directs all the air to your larynx and it goes to the lung. So when you breathe through your nostril, no air goes to your esophagus or in the stomach, it goes all into the lung. During the process also, it secretes nitric oxide from your sinus mucosa. Breath is coming down behind your throat, upper part of your lung, middle part of the lung, lower part of the lung, almost come to the level of a belly button. When you keep doing it for a while, when it comes down the belly button, you hold your breath or breath stops on its own. In yogic term, it's called a cable kumbhak. Then you visualize the breath is coming from the lower part of the lung, middle part of the lung, upper part of the lung, behind your throat, coming out through your nose. From outside, the breath is picking up your prana, the subtle energy which is going to do the healing. Visualize prana is coming through your nostril. In yogic tradition, your whole body does breathing, not only lung. Your skin is breathing, liver is breathing, kidney is breathing. Visualize the prana is going to the organ of healing. For me, prana is coming to my heart. I need to heal my heart. If you have a diabetes, you visualize prana is coming to your pancreas. It does the healing. Kidney problem is coming to your kidney as a kidney healing. It's called a pranic healing. Pranic healing takes care of all of you. You need to quiet down your five senses. Best to do in silence. When you are silent, practice an alternate nostril breathing without closing your nostril. You are in silence, visualize you are breathing out through your left nostril, visualize you are breathing through your left nostril in. Visualize you are breathing out through your right nostril. Visualize you are breathing through your right nostril in. Visualize your breathing out through your left nostril. Then silently you do alternate nostril breathing and you feel the physiological changes. For me, I can feel. I'm touching my index finger and thumb. I can feel the capillary pulsation. My awareness becomes very, very acute. I my, There is a numbness. I don't feel any sensation. This is the effect of your meditation, the physiological effect. At home you continue this in your silence and essentially when you finish, you finish in putting your hands in front, touching your little finger and thumb, separating your ring finger, middle finger and index finger, called a lotus mudra, padma mudra, connects your body, mind and spirit. Bring your lotus close to your heart. Heart is the site of your soul. 
it does all the healing. Practice of yoga restores all the physiological changes. Practice of yoga restores all the hormonal changes in a female body. It corrects all the altered hormonal homeostasis. It gives you a mind, creates a mind, which is a stillness, which is the acceptance. A practice of yoga makes a woman accept all the physiological changes, physiological process she's going through. She accepts it as a part of her normal physiological process. She moves forward and enjoys a good quality life. And that is the reason we see 80 to 85 percent women in our yoga conferences, yoga studios, and yoga teachers training courses. That is the answer to the first question which I ask. Thank you again for joining us. Maybe in the women's health, maybe we do another time in the men's health, yoga therapy for men's health, but men's health is really a lot less than the women. But we'll pick up a topic based on your comments and your input, see which one you'd like, to, like me to discuss. And again and again, I'm telling you, all my discussion, all my presentation here, I'm sharing my practice, my knowledge and experience with all of you, practitioners, yoga, yoga therapy teachers, healthcare providers, so you'll be able to use all my knowledge and experience. Thank you again. I'll see you again on next Saturday. And keep doing yoga and be healthy.